Good evening, everybody. I'm Assemblymember Laura Friedman, and I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening to talk about one of the biggest issues and the biggest crisis we have in our area and in the state of California, which is homelessness. And tonight we're partnering with a bunch of our really amazing local um, uh, entities to talk to you specifically about homelessness and how it affects women. Um, as women are a fast growing population on the streets of Los Angeles and around the state. Um, our partner tonight in bringing this to you is Sir Optimus International of Glendale, uh, which is a service organization to which I'm very proud to be a member. And I'm very, um, very grateful to them for partnering with us to make this possible and to bring this information to you tonight. Um, before I, I move over to our amazing panel, I do wanna share just a little bit of what I've been working on at the state with regard to this issue. Uh, in the past, I've worked on issues around conservatorship for our mentally ill um, homeless individuals and on a lot of um, legislation meant to increase the stock of affordable housing in California. Uh, this year, there's a few bills that I've, worked, that I've introduced that I just want to mention briefly. Um, AB 1377 is a bill that I'm focusing on to, to really take an eye at the growing problem of um, our homeless population living on our transit agencies, which of course is you know, unfortunate for people who feel the need to, to live on a train or live in a train station, but also uh, very disruptive often to the traveling public. <laughs> And so this is something that we've been working with our homeless providers in Los Angeles County and in the Bay Area, and also with our transit agencies to better coordinate efforts between our agencies to make sure that the correct agency is trying to do the outreach and, the, and offer services to that population who is living in transit, while at the same time um, uh, accounting for the special needs and difficulties of providing services on a, an agency like a transit agency. Uh, AB 799, which I'm co-authoring with Luz Rivas in our area, Chris Ward and um, Lori Wilson from Northern California would require the state to take a more direct leadership role in working with local jurisdictions collaboratively when we set um, our homeless reduction targets. And the bill would set up for the first time real consequences for failing to meet our goals, including the potential for funds to be reallocated within the same region but the bill also streamlines administrative burdens on local systems um, to uh, um, also so to make it easier for them to operate while providing more transparency and more information to the public. Uh, so this is a bill that we're hoping will again, focus our efforts where we know it's doing the most good and give the public the transparency that their tax dollars are going to good use. We also have introduced a bill, I've introduced a bill this year to um, help our, our um, foster youth as they age out of our system to make sure that our, our providers are giving them the support that they need before they allow them to emancipate out of the system to be left on their own. I've worked for many years, every single year I've been in the legislature on bills to uplift and support our foster youth as they are disproportionately um, made up, make up our ranks of, of homeless population and our population in our criminal justice system. And these are our children, children that we have collectively taken the responsibility for, and we have in many cases failed them. And I do want to also just mention some of the work that we've done in the last year with the budget um, towards um, homeless um, relief. We allocated $2 billion for a multi-year affordable housing package, including investments in multifamily housing program, the housing accelerator program, the farm worker housing program, ADU financing, and the veterans housing and homeless prevention program. We advanced $1.5 billion, that's billion with a B, over two years for immediate clinically enhanced bridge housing solutions for individuals experiencing homelessness with serious mental illness, uh, along with providing assistance to counties. We included $57 million for county care court startup costs, including $31 million for planning and preparation activities in all counties. We approved the governor's proposal for $50 million of general fund one-time funding for the Cal Food program, including food banks located across the state to mitigate increases in food needs among low-income and food insecure populations across the state. You know, in inflation has made food more expensive and we don't always give people more money to help to account for that. We approved $35.2 million in, general, in the general fund to expand the California Food Assistance Program called um, CFAP um, to Californians age 55 and older, regardless of their immigration status, 
with, with additional funding through 2026 so that no one in our state goes hungry, no seniors go hungry. And we have accelerated the grant increase for vulnerable Californians on SSI and SSP. And with that, I wanna introduce our really wonderful panel of people who have dedicated themselves to helping others in our community. I'm just going to list them and their organizations. And then as they each speak, I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about what their agencies do. Our panelists include Dr. Laura Duncan, very well known to a lot of us in the Glendale and Burbank region. She is the ex executive director of Essentia. Akila Shans, the lead care manager for um, um, Amelia Health and Adventist Health. Carrie Pardo, the director of programs from Home Again Los Angeles. Arsene Essien, homeless programs manager for the uh, city of Glendale. And Pamela Jackson, the housing coordinator for the city of Glendale. And with that, I'm going to turn it over now to Jean Kagan from Seroptimists um, to give us some remarks. Well, good evening all. I'm Jean Kagan. I'm with Seroptimus International. Now, very often when I say Seroptimus International, people go, what is Seroptimus International? Well, Seroptimus International is a global, apolitical volunteer service organization. We are committed to gender equality, empowerment, education, diversity, and fellowship. We have clubs in 122 countries throughout the world. And as of today, we tally 75,000 members. Actually, Seroptimus is a composite word of two Latin words, soror for sister and optima meaning the best. As Seroptimus, we are always focused on what is best for women, women at any age. Now, historically, we've turned our primary efforts to providing women and girls with access to education and training they need to achieve their own economic empowerment. Perhaps our two most well-known initiatives are our Dream It Be It Career Support Initiative, by which we provide girls with the tools they need to achieve education and career goals. Through our Live, it, Live, Live Your Dream Education and training cash awards program, we aid women heads of households who are working towards an undergraduate degree or technical program certification. These women have be overcome incredible challenges, poverty, domestic and sexual violence, addiction. As an organization, we invest more than $2.6 million each year in such education grants. Now, the women of Seroptimus International of Glendale have been on, focused on advancing the cause of women since April 16, 1943. We will in fact be 80 years young in about 18 days. Over these 80 years, we've sold war bonds, raised money to help underwrite the third iron lung put into service in the United States, raise funds, to foster breast cancer awareness and treatment, conducted public forums on human trafficking and hunger, the hidden crisis on our college campus. And for several years, we've even sponsored a senior service club. Well, Sir Optimus International of Glendale was early attentive to the issue of senior housing. We have been the prime movers in bringing into being two senior housing product projects. In 1959, a number of Glendale Seroptimus discovered there were many elderly here who couldn't afford to pay rent unless assisted. Having identified the need, Seroptimus International of Glendale joined with, joined with several other local clubs and the result of which was in 1963, Seroptimus Village. The mission of Seroptimus Village, which is located in Norwalk, was to provide low cost, adequate housing for seniors who were unable financially to provide for themselves. Seroptimus of Glendale did in fact construct one of the units at their own cost, lucky number unit 13, and we also sponsored its first resident. Now, the women of Seroptimus of Glendale are focused and determined. It took us 10 years, but in 1992, along with our partners, Southern California Presbyterian and HUD, 
we broke ground for a 75 unit housing project for low income seniors. That housing unit still stands today. It's called The Gardens and it is on Monterey Street in Glendale. The issue of housing for low income seniors, especially for women, is still very much a societal issue in 2023. An article by Mackenzie May in the August edition of the LA Times noted that the majority of Californians 65 and older are women and 13% live below the poverty line. Now, considering that women live seven years longer than men, we can become especially vulnerable to inflation, escalating housing prices, and the lack of, of affordable housing options. In this setting, senior women can be at increased danger of becoming unhoused. Thank you, Assembly Member Friedman, for bringing together tonight's panel to discuss this extremely important issue. <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sir Optimus, for partnering with me on this event and for everything that you do in the community. Thank you. Um, really, uh, one of the most active groups that we have uh, in Glendale, and just an amazing group of very powerful women. Uh, next, we're going to turn to Dr. Laura Duncan from Essentia to talk to us about their services and what they're seeing right now, um, right in the streets of our own community, for those of you in Glendale. Yes, good evening, and thank you for including me in this important discussion. I heard you say that Sir Optimus had turned 80 years old, so or Sir Optimus itself is in fact an older woman. Anyway, <laughs> I will first share some statistics on homelessness, but first, I'm with Ascensia, as um, Assemblymember Friedman mentioned, and we are a comprehensive homeless services agency that is headquartered in Glendale. So for the statistics, in Los Angeles County, there has been a 23.5% increase, increase in homelessness in the last five years. I'm sure you've noticed. Conversely, in the city of Glendale, there has been a 13% decrease overall in homelessness since 2018. This is because they invest in homeless services. Speaking strictly about Essentia's data, in any given year, between a, a 70 to 80 percent of the people experiencing homelessness that we serve are between the ages of 25 and 64, with roughly 8 to 20 percent under age 25, and 3 to 6 percent of those being minor children. 12 to 14 percent, it's been increasing, of the people we serve are older adults. However, the percentage of female older adults within the, that group has doubled. It used to comprise 41%, and over the past three years, it's grown to 82%. That's a 50% increase in the number of older adult women we're serving. Why? You'll probably hear this repeatedly. Keep this in mind. I've already heard it once, but keep it in mind as I tell you more about what's going on. Women outlive men. There are more women in the older adult population, and incomes for the lowest income older adults have not risen as fast as rents. This leaves a growing number of adult renters to experience homelessness or be at risk for it because they're struggling to cover their housing costs. If you were to come and serve as a guest chef at our shelter, you hadn't been there for a while since before the pandemic, you'd notice that there are more older adults staying with us now than there used to be. People in their 60s, 70s and 80s who've lived in their apartments or housing for decades are being evicted and put out on the streets because they can't afford it. Older adult renters are a large and growing group with the number of renter households headed by someone age 50 and over. And that's expected to grow from 16 million or 35% of all renters five years ago to over 21 million or 40% of all renters by 2038. That's only 15 years away. So we can imagine what it's gonna look like in 25 or 30 years if we don't do something. We need to build more affordable and senior housing yesterday. Next, I'll tell you what trends we've seen at Ascentia in recent years, especially after COVID-19. At our facility in Glendale, we've seen a 51% increase in the request for mental health services. And we found new funding sources each year in order to address the growing need. We've seen that project room key and now home key and creating more interim housing makes a huge difference to protect people from the perils of being unhoused. 
and is a pathway out of homelessness when paired with services and housing vouchers. Plus, it's more cost effective than allowing folks to languish on our streets at great expense to the first responder systems, hospital services, and parks and recreation departments, not to mention the taxpayer. And as mentioned earlier, unfortunately, we've seen an increase in the number of unhoused older adults, especially women. It is a fact that older adults are entering retirement age in worse financial shape than same age households did 20 years ago. More recently, renters in the bottom income quartile for all households have a net wealth of only $1,900 a month. That's for 50 to 64 year olds. And when you get to 65 plus, it's about 1,100 a month. They can't afford the housing. The median income for an Essentia client is $453 a month, up from 413 a year ago. Now I will explain what programs we offer at Essentia. Uh, we offer a complete array of homeless services, but not all programs are offered in each of our service regions. So I'll explain. We provide services in the cities of Glendale, Burbank, West Hollywood, and Hollywood, Los Feliz. We provide services for the Department of Health Services throughout Los Angeles County, and we contract with six area hospitals and three Medi-Cal managed care plans through CalAIM. We're on track to expand our services to Studio City Sherman Oaks this year and to downtown LA and in West Hollywood next year. Our services include street outreach and engagement during weekday business hours and increasingly evenings and weekends, an emergency housing shelter for 45 mixed gender adults and families with minor children. It is also pet friendly. So I like to say it serves about 50. An access center where clients receive case management to foster creation of viable permanent housing and sustainable income plans. There, they also receive referrals for legal services, debt consolidation, addiction recovery and employment services, and linkages to entitlements such as benefits they qualify for and tutoring for school-aged children. Clients can also receive trauma therapy, telepsychiatry, occupational therapy, group therapy, parenting classes, family therapy, children's art therapy, and they may attend financial literacy classes, all of which have proven results. We provide housing location navigation and housing retention services. They need help finding housing and then be remaining stably housed. We have permanent supportive housing programs and intensive case management. And um, an unhoused hospital patient integrate, integrated health homes and retention program and enhanced care management to provide homeless services to unhoused Medi-Cal patients. Finally, I will cover specific programs for women and older adult women. Older adults are prioritized for shelter as are single mothers and their children because they are some of the most vulnerable subpopulations that we find in the homeless population. Occupational therapy has proven to be extremely helpful to older adults. One example is that it provides socialization versus isolation. High numbers of women utilize our trauma therapy services as they experience sexual and intimate partner violence more often than their male counterparts. And women also attend more parenting classes and family therapy sessions with their children because 90% of our single parents are, are women. And lastly, financial literacy classes are very helpful for women who have fled domestic violence situations where their abusive partners controlled all aspects of the family's finances. They oftentimes do not know the first thing about opening a bank account or, or handling a checkbook or how to budget. And um, that's also very beneficial financial literacy for the older adults that has been referenced um, by others and myself where they can no longer afford housing. They come to us and have to figure things out again to get back into housing and stay there. So um, thank you very much for listening and allowing me to present. Thank you so much. And we will be um, asking questions of all the panelists. I have some questions that I know I'm gonna wanna ask and if you're watching at home, um, you are more than welcome to go into the chat, the Q&A section of this Zoom and ask any questions that you might have and we'll do our best to get to them. And we'll also, we are also watching on Facebook. So if you ask on, in Facebook, we'll also try to get to those questions. And if we don't get to your questions this evening, we'll do our best to get one of our panelists to ask, to answer your question and get, a, get you a response if you give us your email address. 
And if you just want to pass information along to them or tell them your thoughts, we'll also do our best to get those distributed to the correct panelist or panelists so that they can see what you're thinking. Next, we're moving to Akila Shans from Amkara Adventist um, for her comments. Hi, thank you guys for having me. So um, first, uh, my name is Akila Shans. I'm the lead care manager supervisor for LA County as well as Kern County. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about what Community Connect is. So Community Connect is a social focus program that deploys care teams into the community to meet patients wherever they are and identify, address social and behavioral barriers to access healthcare services that they may need. Um, we cover all eight um, re spas in LA County. So any, any spa in LA County, we cover. Um, so I'm gonna first go over what is my experience working in the field with the unhoused. Um, first of all, I've been doing this for 20 years. I advocate for the unhoused because I used to be homeless um, 10 years ago. Um, I wanna help the community give back what was given to me. Having that shared lived experience has opened many doors for me in the communities that I serve, which is, again, like I said, all eight spas in LA County. I've fallen in love with the challenge of the process and the unhoused communities. It requires a high level of commitment and focus. So um, I participate in homeless count every single year and I've been in a housing navigator, shelter monitor, supervisor, and reentry case manager for Tarzana Treatment Center. Some of the trends that I've seen over the years, um, one of the most troubling trends in the community is the surge of women experiencing chron chronic patterns of homelessness who have been homeless for over 12 months and the lack of resources for homeless women and the elderly. Um, and then what programs, projects and incentives does Encara um, Healthcare have? Um, so we do the homeless court in Redondo Beach. Um, we have a monthly commitment with them to do to go out to work with the, the community for the homeless in that area. And we show up at the courts to be able to provide our services to them. So they have aftercare services once they get out of whatever the judge orders them to do within that, that community. We provide wraparound services, not just for the members, but the entire member, meaning if somebody enrolls into our program, um, we can service the entire family. Um, we do in-home um, check-ins and support. We have access to RNs. And it's a new program that came out from Medi-Cal. So it's a pilot program. So we haven't even been on the ground for almost a year. So we're still learning as we go. But um, having the experience and being in this community for 20 years, like I'm just here and open for to help in any way that I can. So um, I know I'm probably have more time to go, but that's all I have for now. Well, that's great. That was a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Um, next, we have Carrie Pardo from Home Again LA. Hi, how are you, everybody? Uh, thank you for having me here today. My name is Carrie Prado. Um, I am the director of programs for Home Again LA. Uh, Home Again LA is a nonprofit, uh, mainly servicing families here in Glendale and Burbank. We do cover all of Spall too. Um, Home Again LA has five core programs. I'd like to just tell you what we do. Uh, we run a 90-day shelter in partnership with um, our churches and our communities, um, and it is a family shelter. Um, we also do rapid rehousing um, for all uh, for families and for individuals um, at the time being. Uh, rapid rehousing is a program where you pay our clients will pay 30% of their income. We pay the variance of the rent anywhere from six to 12 months. Um, it's a fast way to get people off the street and into housing while we stabilize them um, while they're in housing. Um, we also have a transitional housing uh, unit here in Burbank, which we're really proud of, Jerry's Promise. It's a two-year program, so families can, uh, each unit is a two-bedroom, and so they're paying very minimal rent to stay there. Um, and while they're there, they're uh, utilizing our financial literacy courses and a lot of our um, just different resource connections so that at the end of the two years, uh, they're going back into fair market rate housing and or our long-term goal is to get some home buyers um, in, our, in our sites. Um, we also do a lot of homeless prevention. Since COVID has uh, come our way, homeless prevention has really been a new and um, exciting thing that we've kind of taken on. Um, we really want to make sure that we are uh, giving all of our community 
you know, putting our resources out into the community so folks are not experiencing homelessness. Um, and we are able to uh, do that specifically in Burbank and Glendale um, for the prevention services. Um, we also um, are doing community workshops. Uh, we have a program, Lifting People Up, uh, which we run and that consists of life skills, financial literacy, job development, um, resource connection. And so those things, uh, it's, uh, those classes are open to all of the community. Um, we have two classes a week over Zoom and in person. And those really are meant to, um, are, are meant to really get information out there, but it also is very close in conjunction with our homeless prevention. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now is education. It's getting information out to our community that there are resources out there that they can take advantage of. Uh, we are seeing a huge influx of um, homeless families, homeless single moms, um, and um, older adults, unfortunately. Um, it's about 87% of our clients are single mothers. And with that being said, the educational piece is so important. Um, not only to get them, um, you know, back into on the right path as far as, but you know, uh, career improvement and uh, financial literacy, but really making sure that all that we're covering all of the bases when it comes to connecting folks to resources. Uh, we've definitely seen that the older adults are not completely aware of all of the things that they could be um, sort of receiving, and so one of the new things that we're doing is partnering with um, low-income senior. Uh, senior units and places like Jocelyn Center to sort of make sure that we are educating those folks and making sure that they have access to things like food stamps um, and, you know, IHSS services for their families that are helping take care of them. Um, so, yeah, we're really proud to be here and thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for giving us that excellent rundown. And uh, next we're gonna to move to Arsene Asayan from Glendale's housing program from the city of Glendale. <laughs> Good evening, assembly member Friedman. It's a pleasure for me to be here this evening. Good evening to everyone. I'm happy to see some of our partnering agencies on this panel as well. Um, so who we are, the city of Glendale serves as the uh, coordinated entry or continuum of care lead agency. Uh, we receive local, state, federal funds. We are a direct recipient. And what we do is we partner with our local homeless service providing uh, providers um, to build a really strong homeless response system for our community. Um, some of the programs that we operate are funded through the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We have various permanent supportive housing programs. We have transitional housing programs and, of course, an emergency shelter um, that we utilize. Um, Asensia, actually, Dr. Duncan and her team, Asensia, they serve as our lead agency in the city of Glendale and what we call a coordinated entry system. So all of the, all of the homeless individuals that are seeking services in the city of Glendale can access services at Essentia um, and can get connected to housing and uh, wraparound services. We also have the pleasure of working with Home Again LA. They serve as our lead for homeless families who are seeking services. Um, and we also partner with the YWCA of Glendale and Pasadena to provide um, emergency shelter and services to our families who are fleeing domestic violence and other related crimes. We do have many partners in the community, such as Catholic Charities. Um, we work with the Armenian Relief Society. Um, we provide an array of homeless services from homeless prevention to rapid rehousing, emergency shelters. We really try to do whatever we can to support our families. Um, what we also do annually is the homeless point in time count. So the city of Glendale does lead this effort on an annual basis and we do rely on our homeless service providers to help us do this. And one of the things that we discovered this past year is that there has been an overall about a 20% increase in our aging population, which is very concerning for us. And it's something that we're keeping a very close eye on. Um, even though the numbers seem small, um, they're not. Of the 225 homeless um, individuals and families that we encountered on the night of the count, about 31 were seniors uh, the age of 62 and above. 
Um, these are seniors who have multiple chronic health conditions. Um, some do suffer from severe mental illness and substance abuse as well. And one of the, the alarming things about this is when we would ask this group, when we ask the group during the night of the count, um, if they were homeless, when did they become homeless? And majority responded to becoming homeless for the first time um, at the age of 62. Um, and so that's something we're keeping a very close eye on in the city of Glendale. And we're working closely with our providers to ensure that we have a prioritization process in place um, to make sure that we can get our elderly or aging population off the streets as quickly as possible. Um, this year, the city was awarded about 200 a little over 255 vouchers, uh, emergency housing vouchers, um, which is essentially subsidized housing, similar to Section 8, for those of you that are familiar with the Section 8 program. And one of the things that we have done, actually, along with Dr. Duncan and her team, is we have made sure to prioritize our senior or elderly population um, who are currently unsheltered or who are staying in our emergency shelters. Um, so that's something that we're very proud of that we're able to quickly transition um, our elderly population into uh, stable housing. One of the things I, I think that's really important to mention is not only is it important to exit um, this population into housing as quickly as possible, but recidivism is also really key, retention, housing stability. We are seeing that about 56% of our clients in our existing permanent housing programs have a growing need on mental health services, uh, substance abuse, they're suffering from chronic health conditions. So the city is looking at ways to actually support the clients in our existing programs as well to prevent recidivism. Um, one of the things that we have done is we've actually partnered with Essencia and the state um, our managed care plans, LA Care and HealthNet, to actually bring in um, support to our aging population and our existing programs. And this is done through the state's housing and homeless incentive program. It's called HIP. We're very excited about this partnership. It is very new, and the city of Glendale will be a direct recipient for the first time. So, um, if this funding goes through, we're in the final stages, we will be able to maintain um, intensive case management for our aging population and our programs. There's a, a lot of work that we need to do. We absolutely need to increase our affordable housing stock, um, you know, the rent burden on our families and our individuals. That's something that we really need to work on. Um, increasing the housing stock and also collaboration, not with our local agencies, but also regional collaboration, cross-jurisdictional collaborations, bringing in a lot of support to be able to build this strong, robust homeless response system in Glendale and our surrounding communities. So the city of Glendale is very much, we're excited um, as we finish our first ever homeless action plan for our city, um, we will be incorporating all of these challenges and needs and gaps in our community um, as part of our action plan. I did want to briefly speak about our outreach program. So the city does currently work with Essencia to provide outreach during um, the weekdays, Monday through Friday. However, during the pandemic, we were able to expand on our existing outreach programs to bring in our law enforcement team the Glendale Police Department's Community Outreach and Engagement Team. Um, this program has proven to be very successful. Thus far, we have outreached to about 298 homeless individuals, 94, of which um, 104 have actually some type of mental illness or substance abuse, which is a significant number uh, in our community. Uh, however, we have been able to successfully place about 39 clients so far in a housing program and provide much needed wraparound services. 21 of those 39 individuals that are unsheltered, um, which do happen, we do happen to have an aging population in that group, have been connected to our uh, emergency housing voucher program. So we hope to continue expanding this program. We want to ramp up our mental health and substance abuse programs, and we are keeping a very close eye on the aging population, particularly. We really want to make sure that we have a strong strong programs in place and support to, to help this group. Um, last thing I wanna mention is homeless families. 
uh, households who, um, a single single mother uh, households, um, there was a 57% increase in our homeless families this year during our homeless count, which is also very concerning. In fact, our homeless families are about, represent 57% of our total homeless count. That's more than our single adults. Uh, single adults were at about 43%. So we need to also keep a close eye on that, um, the trends that we're seeing. Um, so that's it, just to give you, hopefully, <laughs> provided enough information, I'm happy to answer any other questions that you might have. And we do have a very detailed, comprehensive report on the Homeless Services website. For those of you who are interested, uh, please make sure that you um, take a look at our report. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Thanks for being here. And we have somebody else from the City of Glendale from the um, Housing Division, Pamela Jackson. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. I am Pamela Jackson, Housing Coordinator for the City. Um, I work on a team that is responsible for developing affordable housing in the city and also overseeing um, monitoring all of the housing that we do develop um, in the city. And so I'll talk a little bit about what we have done and what we're currently doing um, and also what we anticipate doing in the future uh, with regard to developing affordable housing, especially for seniors. Um, the city has developed over 14 or been involved with developing over 1400 units of affordable housing in the city over the years. Um, about 42% of that, um, of those units are designated for seniors. Um, and we develop these units in a variety of ways. We use um, federal funding, state funding, we also um, have density bonus programs where we encourage developers to um, provide affordable housing. And so um, that's an ongoing thing. Um, each time we develop a, a building, uh, we have a large response, um, especially for seniors. When we have an opening, I'd say probably around 2,000 to 5,000 applications generally, you know, we anticipate receiving for those openings and it may just be for a small number of units. So there is a big demand. Um, many, of course, many seniors that we encounter are on SSI or social security. And so they are extremely low income, very low income and can barely afford to pay these exorbitant rents that are happening in the market. Um, when we do have an opening, we try our best to outreach to as many people as possible. Um, we have an affordable housing interest list that we have maintained uh, for a few years now. There's over 20,000 people on that list that say they wanna be notified when we have an opening. And so we, um, you know, we, we notify all those people uh, when there is an opportunity and we let them know how they can apply. We create flyers that are um, not only in English, but in Armenian and Spanish, which are our other two large um, languages in the city. Uh, so we are outreaching to as many people as possible. Um, now, currently in development, we have three projects. Um, the first one is at 900 East Broadway in Glendale. It's called Citrus Crossing. It's on the site that used to be Tobin World, if you're familiar with uh, Glendale. Uh, for that project, we are developing 127 units for extremely low, very low and low income seniors over the age of 62 and older. Uh, the next project is 90, uh, 920 East Broadway, also on that Tobin World site. And that will be 40 units of affordable housing for extremely low, very low and low income seniors over the age of 62. And finally, uh, 515 Pioneer, that's probably the biggest project that we've done. Uh, 340 units, it will be split between seniors and also um, uh, small families, all extremely low, very low and low income households. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're currently doing. Um, we also recently acquired a property in Glendale, which we will be developing um, over the course of the next couple of years. But we think we will get about 
58 to 67 units out of that building. And right now it's looking like that will, um, those units will go for seniors because of the way um, the existing, existing building is. Um, the rooms within the building are really set up ideally for seniors. So that will be our target population. And then the last thing I will mention is um, right now we are trying to, oh, we are submitting a plan to HUD for how we anticipate spending home ARP dollars. So home ARP dollars are part of the American Rescue Plan, which was uh, signed into law back in 2021. Um, a large amount of funding in that plan was set aside for um, cities and jurisdictions to deal with issues of homelessness, people at risk of homelessness, people fleeing domestic violence, um, and other populations that are at greatest risk of housing instability. And so we're submitting a plan for how to spend those dollars. We will be allocated a little over $5.1 million in funding. Um, and so, you know, that'll be a process once we get the funding. Uh, we, we may spend that money on the project that I just mentioned that we recently acquired. Um, and so the, the populations that we serve with that funding have to be either homeless, at risk of homelessness, um, or, or the other populations that I mentioned, domestic violence survivors, um, and other families that are at risk of, uh, that are at greatest risk of housing instability. And so those are the things that we're doing right now. Uh, our team is very busy. Um, we're a small team, but we're kicking out quite a bit of work. So you know, that's, that's where we are. And, you know, if I have any questions, I'll be happy to take them at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your presentation. So we've got a lot of questions coming in. And I've got some questions. Um, and it, you know, it is, I think, very um, relieving to see the amount of effort that's being put into this huge problem from so many different agencies. Uh, you know, and it, it sort of bears pointing out that these are agencies that are all working in our area. We're not bringing in, you know, agencies from all across the state. So you can see that there's a lot of different um, uh, approaches and that it's multi-jurisdictional. It's nonprofits, it's the county, it's the cities. And this, they're looking at, as you heard, not just placing people, but also how do we create more affordable housing? Uh, how do we offer services that will keep people, you know, out of uh, homelessness? And, you know, there's other groups that are involved in those efforts as well, whether it's educational or on the mental health side. So that the sort of chain of, of different individuals and groups that are working on this issue is, is pretty long. So to that end, one of the questions that we had was going back to some of the, the root causes of homelessness and also women in particular. And that's about the, the um, connection to domestic violence. Um, you know, as, as was mentioned, I think by a few of the panelists that you know, some of the women that we do see experiencing homelessness are there because they had to escape a, a domestic situation uh, that was violent. They had to leave without support services, often without any money or resources. If the purse strings are being controlled by their abuser, abuser, they might be afraid to go into services. They might be hiding. Uh, they might have children either with them or that they had to leave at home and dealing with those issues. So do you, and I'm asking whoever wants to answer about the coordination between groups like the YWCA uh, uh, I think Door of Hope is another, and, and the different various groups that focus on domestic violence. And how do you interact with those groups? And how uh, successful have you been at getting women, particularly, but anyone experiencing domestic violence, rehoused uh, and uh, set to a, a permanent, a way of being able to uh, escape their abuser permanently? And whoever wants to answer can just jump in. I can jump in on there only just uh, we work really closely with the YWCA, um, mainly providing rapid rehousing services for their clients. Uh, so a lot of time the domestic violence issues and um, the crisis housing will be done in house with the YWCA and then their case managers will work with our case managers to provide the navigation services um, and inevitably the rapid rehousing services. I will say um, just a story comes to mind. Uh, we recently had a mom who was with her husband for years. 
um, and was experiencing domestic violence and needed to leave. Unfortunately, nothing was ever in her name. All of the cars, all of the houses, credit cards, banks, everything was in um, the father's name. And so when she left, she really had absolutely no history, um, which we found to be really difficult. It was almost harder than her having bad credit and things of that nature because they're just you know, at 50 something years old, there was just nothing on paper that she had really ever had. Uh, she had been a cleaning lady for years and worked for cash and kind of had her own little business. And so we really had to get um, to think outside of the box. And so we um, went ahead and, you know, got all of the people that she worked for to write her letters stating that how long that she had worked for them and how much she was getting paid. We immediately got her bank account and sort of set up these steps. But um, it just goes back to something that Laura had said earlier that um, a lot of these women are are literally leaving with absolutely nothing and starting um, from, from the ground zero. Uh, good news is we were able to get this mother housed with her child. Um, it was about three years ago. And as, as far as I know, she is still housed. I believe we follow her daughter on a or her daughter follows us on Facebook, uh, so they check in. But my point being is it really did take a, a, a lot of work and team effort on both of our parts as far as the YWCA and ourselves to kind of get that done. Um, but we definitely we definitely work hand in hand um, when it comes to the rapid rehousing and, and getting folks into permanent housing. Thank you. Does anybody want to add anything? You certainly don't have to. And okay. I, uh, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If I may just add something on the city's end, um, we did allocate a significant amount of money, uh, significant amount of funds to the YWCA of Glendale and Pasadena and to Door of Hope, another agency that we work with. Um, and this was as a result of the pandemic. The city received a significant amount of funding, over $3.7 million through the Emergency Solutions Grant Program, CARES Act funds. So we did ensure, make sure to prioritize funding for families who were fleeing DV, uh, homeless prevention and rapid rehousing funds. What we hope to do in the next year or so is also expand on our existing rapid rehousing program and look at the possibility of doing maybe a joint transitional housing and rapid rehousing program, which would allow our families a little bit more time to get acclimated to their new, you know, their new lifestyle, right? Um, going through a transitional housing program and then having to maintain their housing on their own after a year or, or six months sometimes isn't enough time for our families to stabilize. So in terms of the city, we are looking at becoming a bit more innovative and uh, possibly doing joint programs, maybe transitional housing and rapid rehousing. Just wanted to add to that. Thank you. We are going getting so many great questions coming in. Um, here's one that I think is a really pertinent question. Um, do any of you work, and I think someone had mentioned some programs to keep people from becoming homeless and keep them in their, their units. So my question is, how do you identify in the first place who might be on the verge of becoming homeless? How, how would you find and identify those people? And then what do you do? What do you do um, once you have warning? Like, what are the warning signals? And I, I wonder if maybe the city um, might be able to talk and, and maybe some of the others of you. For instance, I've heard, you know, just anecdotally that one of the signs of someone who's about to become homeless is someone who stops paying utility bills. And it's been suggested that cities proactively reach out to anyone who's fallen into a, a, arrears, let's say two months past their utility bills, not just to send them the typical, we're going to turn off your utilities, but hey, are you okay? Are you having trouble paying for your, your unit? Are you having trouble paying your, your mortgage? Um, and, and, you know, proactively reaching out to see what you can do to stabilize them before uh, the debts pile up so much that they lose their place to live. So anyone want to talk about that? How do you identify people and how do you keep them housed in the first place? Anybody? Okay. Oh, Akila, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I could speak a little bit about what we do. We have, um, when we originally reach out to our members um, that are enrolled in our program, part of our intake process of um, the tools is those are specific answers that we are questions that we ask. We ask if we have any bills that haven't been paid in the, in the um, past 90 days, if they need assistance with it. There's certain questions that we've utilized to um as part of our assessment is asking those specific questions because once we know we can really figure out 
if they're in the danger of becoming homeless, if they are in a home, and then we find the resources to get those bills paid for them so they don't lose their home. So we, we incorporate that in some of the questions that we asked in our original tools that we have when we're enrolling our members into the program. And we found that that helps. Great. Um, somebody asked, um, mentioned that in Pasadena, there are places where homeless women particularly can do their laundry, get a haircut, take a shower, maybe get clothing. Uh, so to, to really help people who are just on the streets be able to be safe and sanitary and you know, maybe find job or find housing. Is there anything like that in Burbank or Glendale? Uh, not specifically in Burbank or Glendale, but we often uh, will work with MEND, who is right around the corner from us in, I believe it's North Hollywood, and they do laundry services and things of that nature. And of course, I know uh, Sensei does laundry services too, which is great um, for individuals. And I think the question is sort of, you know, is there a sort of sort of day shelter so people can, mm. you know, pop in, you know, maybe they can receive some services or get some advice, uh, but sort of just a walk in and, and, you know, take care of some of these basic needs. Is, is that a place where, for instance, Essentia, if someone just walked in the door and said, can I have a shower? Uh, you know, what, what would you do? Okay, well, we are an access center, not a drop in center that you sounds like you're talking about a drop in center. But um, we we would encourage somebody to do an intake with us and get enrolled if they were eligible. And in that case, they would they would have access to um, showering and laundry, phone bank, computers, whatever they needed to do to, to uh, get themselves out of the situation. Um, if we did have room in our shelter, which we usually don't, not right away, Johnny on the spot, we would refer and, and try to help them get connected to um, a, an alternate shelter or interim housing site location where they could be they could be safe and they could still access the rest of the services with us. Um, perhaps they could be referred to a drop-in center, but it wouldn't be local. I think the closest one is in um, would be Hope of the Valley, which would be in San Fernando. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question all the way from Florida. Um, which is how is your organization, what are the, what the, what are the barriers to coordinating for people uh, experiencing homelessness and how do you work together to make sure people just don't fall between the cracks? Well, I guess I'll answer that. <laughs> communication, communication, communication. Um, we're very fortunate in Glendale. We have an incredible team where we're a phone call away. Um, that's really how we coordinate with one another. When there's a client in need, we communicate. Sometimes the response takes five minutes, sometimes 10. But I mean, it. Um, we really work very closely with our service providers. And the city is very much involved in making sure that coordination takes place. We also have the homeless information management system that we utilize is the HMIS system. And we all have access to the shared database. In fact, countywide, we have access with LA County, COC, Pasadena, and Glendale. So we're able to quickly communicate, whether it's through the system with each other to get our clients housed as quickly as possible. We actually also coordinate with our local hospitals as well. We have contacts at each hospital along with our Glendale Unified School District. That's actually one of the ways that we identify our homeless families who are at risk of becoming homeless. On a daily basis, we get calls and emails um, requesting assistance. Um, so this is uh, really, we do have a strong team that communicates um, and you know the sense of urgency is there. So that's how we're able to um, work with our clients. Great, and we have a Burbank City Council member, Tama Takahashi, who just wrote that the Burbank Temporary Aid uh, Center also does provide some of those walk-in services in Burbank. Um, I, I have a, a couple of, of questions. You know, we get contacts a lot in my office from people who are worried about a neighbor, let's say, and it often happens that it's a senior woman uh, and they may be, they live in an apartment building and there's a senior woman neighbor, you know, to someone down the hall, the rent's gone up, and they're calling us because they're worried that that senior who's on a fixed income, who's all alone, can't afford to pay her rent. Um, my question to all of you is, if that happens, if you get an outreach from someone who just, you know, a senior woman, let's say, 70-year-old woman who just can't pay her rent, 
what are the chances that you'd be able to either get her rental assistance and, you know, quickly enough to keep her from becoming evicted or get her immediately rehoused? How, what is the availability of housing, of rehousing, permanent rehousing for someone like that who can't, who's older, fixed income, can't pay their bills? Is it, the, is it the situation where you, you know, next you've got a list of available units, you just move them into another place? What happens to them? Because there's a lot of those people in our community. We had a case like that very recently where somebody who used to be um, a very successful um, hospital administrator who's up in years 79 um, got evicted in Burbank and was literally on the streets homeless. And we that is a high priority case. So she did come in right away. Um, we created space, she went right to the top of the list and um, discovered that there were some memory issues. And the reason she got evicted was because she wasn't paying her rent because she thought she already had, <laughs> you know? So that's a factor too with the older adult population. And sometimes they need a higher level of care. So you have to work with getting an assessment through a physician and then have them referred to an appropriate, you know, like assisted living facility or something of that nature. Um, when that's, when it's not quite to that level and uh, they can be referred to another interim type of housing. Cause you know, none of these shelters are designed for people to stay there for a super long period of time. And with the gross lack of av available affordable housing, we sometimes have to shuffle people around to different shelters and interim housing locations. Um, oftentimes they can go to the tiny home village or just, um, and, and but we never give up as a system and as a collective, making sure that they get where they need to be to be housed again. And whether it's a higher level of care or not, we follow it through. So I, 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 it sounds like, you know, for people who are, you know, fixed income, it could be any age, but I'm just, choosing seniors because they have a less ability of, of changing their income level. Often, oftentimes they can't work. They couldn't get a job because of their age. Um, you know, what I'm hearing is that it's not the case that you just be able to turn around and find them another affordable apartment to live in. And I, I just want to really drill that home because I don't think that people always appreciate the connection between our lack of housing that people can afford and the amount of homelessness that we see. And there's a limited number of shelter beds. So for every shelter bed that's taken up by that senior woman, there's maybe a younger person who's denied a shelter bed. In fact, let me ask you, how many people who come in who are looking for permanent housing, let's say, or shelter housing, you're just unable to find a bed for them for that particular night or the next night? Well, at Ascensia, we have a prioritization wait list that's got well over 300 people on it at any given time. And it's not first come, first served. It's most vul most vulnerable gets the next bed. Because it, I think that there is an impression sometimes with the, with the population that anyone who's on the streets is sort of there by choice or because they're just you know, severely mentally ill. But it sounds like, when, and I just want to hear it from all of you, are there people that right now we see on the streets who would take a bed if it was available to them? Yes, Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. That's something that we are trying to push forward to create more beds, non-congregate sheltering. We are deprived when it comes to shelter beds. I know I could speak for the city of Glendale. That's one thing that we're struggling with. How do we give people safe and dignified place to stay? There's people that are ready to go. When our outreach teams approach them, they're ready for help. But if that help is not there in that minute, then you lose them. And then you have to come back and try again, you know, the following week. So that's something that we are struggling with in Glendale. Yes, absolutely. And to your question about the seniors who are at risk of becoming homeless, I think one of the key things that we have to focus on is landlord engagement. We have so many landlords that I receive calls from directly to help senior clients. And we have done just that through our emergency housing vouchers. These landlords are so patient and understanding. It's just a matter of also engaging and connecting with the landlords to get them to participate, pulling in landlord incentive programs, helping them with the process, expediting the paperwork, trying to do whatever you can to engage that landlord to help you keep that senior house. We've actually experienced that quite a, the last year, quite a few seniors that we've been able to house as a result of our landlord engagement efforts. 
Thank you. Anybody else? This will be our last question. So this is a good chance for you to, you know, to sort of, if you have anything else to say on this topic to say, and I think Akila, you're going to speak. Oh, no, I was just agreeing with what um, Arsene was saying, because uh, just knowing the struggle and me being in this community for so long, doing the work that I've done and also being formerly homeless myself and understanding this I, I can't even call it a tragic. I don't even have a word for it, but I just totally agree with everything that our scene is saying. And um, that's all I want to say. It's a hard one to swallow sometimes. I think that that's a really great place for us to end with that, what, what I would call a call to action, that if we're going to end this problem, we need to give it the resources that it needs in terms of bottom line, people need more housing. We need a place where people can go that they can afford and uh, you know, at every single level. And so I really appreciate that. And uh, I also, for all of you who have been watching, I very much wanna thank you because the only way to solve this problem too is as a community. I truly believe that it's something that we all have to have an engagement in, even if it's just supporting policies that, that bring more affordable housing and shelter beds online in our community so that we can service everyone and meet them where they're at. Uh, a lot of these people, you know, that I do come across them in our, my everyday life um, as an elected official, they're your neighbors, they're your friends, they're people's parents. Uh, these are our community members um, who, you know, find themselves often just in a really difficult situation, whether it's a senior woman with a memory issue, as we heard about, you know, who's just fallen behind and gets evicted to a young person who's, you know, come here to find their dream and finds themselves struggling without help. You know, everyone's got a story, but everybody deserves a chance and everybody deserves a safe place to live. So we will try to get all of your questions answered. We really appreciate your sending them in. Uh, we've been monitoring the chat. I wanna thank our panelists for being here with us tonight and certainly for their work in the community. And lastly, I wanna thank the Seroptimist for partnering with me on this very important town hall. Have a really wonderful night. And as always, if anybody has any emergency needs or any questions in this area, please reach out to my office, for my, to my assembly office. We will try to get you the help that you need. We'll try to point you towards resources, connect you with a provider, or get your question answered. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks for being here with us. Good night. <laughs>